Sorry, um, everyone is actually here, so uh, no point waiting for two minutes. Um, welcome to you all anyway. Um, for tonight, certainly, um, at least, if you have any questions at any time, you can throw them in the chat or you can just um, you can just interrupt me. Um, actually, we haven't got everyone. Sorry, I can, can't count. I, I better wait another two minutes. Okay, we'll start now. So, um, as I said, I was trying to say, uh, you can interrupt me at any time, any questions, either just unmute yourself and start shouting or throw it into the chat. That's uh, no problem whatsoever. So the first thing is um, we, we need to kind of decide how to do the delivery. Um, now I have sent this out, but I'll just talk about it briefly. So there's three models that we can have uh, we can have all live, um, we can have a mix, Oops, excuse me, uh, a mix, and we can have offline. So the issue with the live is, um, I mean, in terms of the benefits, you have regular kind of live contact, but I don't know, in my experience in these lectures, like we could go for three hours, I, I may as well be in here talking to myself. So, I mean, it seems um, not to be much by the way of contact, but it is it is, it is a pro. Um, if you want to kind of keep a regular schedule, um, it's an option. Personally, I, I think that's kind of a, it isn't really a reason to do it because in the other two models, you can choose to watch We'll talk about what they are. You can choose to watch them on the night anyway. So live basically means uh, every week, Tuesday, 7 to 10. Um, and the way it will work is we'll have a 20, we'll start at 5, we would start at 5 past 7. Uh, we'd go till 5 to 10. Uh, I'll keep lecturing until I have enough done. And then we'll have a time for questions and answers. But um, the questions and answers are probably based on stuff that you did the week beforehand. Okay, so that's the first option. Um, I don't, I don't want that option, but uh, I want, I want you to have the say in it. Okay, the second option then is well, maybe the offline is better to explain. So in this one, you have pre-recorded lectures. Um, now the. The truth about the live lectures is including this lecture now, this is rec being recorded. And so this will be accessible to you afterwards and the whole way through, but it's gonna be a big three hour video and it'll have breaks in it. Well, the one break we have, it'll have interruptions. Um, so if, you, if you're not here this evening, for example, it's not going to be very nice watching the three hours of lectures because this, you know, you'll be, It'll be a mess. But with the pre recorded lectures, we don't have the breaks. It's not a big three hour block. Break them up into smaller pieces, um, which means it's easy to find. There's less messing around um, in terms of interruptions. And the big thing is a live lecture will take longer. So there's three hours essentially in the live. I'd expect that to be two hours in the offline. Now, it could take you. Um, three hours to watch two hours of YouTube because our videos, because you will, it'll give you a chance to pause and rewind and all of that. 
Um, so it could still take three hours, even though the video is two hours long. Now that on its own, there's no real reason for you to go for that. It, it just suits me, oh, I've got flexibility. But with the offline, you're going to get individual feedback. Now, the way that's going to work is, um, so you, I'll send an email tomorrow. Um, actually, I won't. Well, anyway, you'll get an email about what's going on in week two. Actually, sorry, you will get an email tomorrow. And it'll say that the exercises that I'd like you to try. Um, now, we'll be a little bit behind the curve because I want to give you just some time to think about this. I don't, there's some time when I said the vote will be closed. You're going to have a vote on this. And what happens is you do the exercises, you write them up, you send photos of them, you submit them to Canvas. And what I'll do for each of you is I'll go through your work um, I'll have it in front, it'll be on the screen, and I'll be um, I'll be talking over it. So you'll be getting individual feedback on your work. Now, if you're very good, um, well, that's great. You're not really going to get much time. You know, it could be a two-minute video, but I, these videos have gone up to like 20 minutes. And so, like, say, in a really bad scenario where, well, bad, but say there's 15 of us in the class, and we all do like 15 minutes. That's now that's that's at least four hours for me. That's four hours live, but obviously there's messing around as well. But as far as I'm concerned, it works for me because I have the flexibility to record the lecture at another time. So I don't mind. I've I I find students love this or hate this. Um so that's what we'll talk about why there's a vote. Um, they hate it because they feel they don't have any contact, uh, human contact in the lecture. Um, but the students who said that, and these are first year students, would not submit work. And I could show you um, the students who actually submitted work and got the video feedback all wanted it because we had a bit of an issue with the first years where some of them were giving out. And I gave them a big vote and they all actually vote to keep this. Now, there's a happy medium that I probably should have done with those first years where there's like pre-recorded uh, lectures. And then I can't remember what I wrote. Maybe it was two hours, maybe it was less, I'm not sure. And then there's two hours uh, Zoom as well. I think, or was it one hour? I don't know. Maybe it was one hour actually. Um, I think it's just one hour. So yeah, it's one hour. So you get, um, in this model, the, the lectures are pre-recorded. Um, but the you don't get the feedback, but you do get the human contact. But you'll have a Zoom one hour every Tuesday evening, and it's not so that would be where you ask questions, um, and I answer them basically. But you're not really it's good in a way, but you're not really getting the feedback. I mean, I know I've been teaching for ten years now. Plus, you you get the learning when you do the exercises. So. If it's a case of you do the exercises and you have questions, that's fine. Um, but you're still not going to, so maybe you do the exercise, but you're still not going to get one-to-one um, -one help. So essentially there's a, um, a vote on this, it's up to you and you vote in preference. Now what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to avoid a situation where there's loads of unhappy people. So when I do the vote, um, say if most people say they hate live that's their third choice then that will be thrown out and then those votes will be reallocated now maybe it could be a case where i probably sh i could do there's another one where i could do um pick the one that least people hate and that's probably what i kind of described but that's not actually the way the vote's going to go um so after tonight uh, i'll probably send the email tomorrow you'll have a little bit of time to think about what you like, you'll see what live is like tonight. Um, I think I've sent you stuff to show you what the offline is like. Um, and my strong recommendation is the offline. The easiest for me is live or mix. Well, live maybe not because um, I don't have the flexibility. Um, mix maybe because I don't have to do all the video feedback. I just do one hour Zoom. But I'm quite happy to do the feedback because I know it's the, in my opinion, it's the best for your learning. Um, that's kind of the payoff for me. Okay, so um, there'll be more information about that has been already sent out, but you will be voting on that. 
So we're going to do the live, and then I, whenever it is Thursday morning, uh, I'll tell you which model we're going for. Um, I will tell you at the moment it looks like it's going to be offline. And num every single person has emailed me said they want that model. And I do think it's the best. Okay. So um, tonight, though, we'll just have it as if it was live. So you just have some idea of me. So um, yeah, this module. So this module, you're obviously bridging, if I understand it correctly, from um, into level seven engineering. That's mostly what this cert is about, as far as I understand. And this module is, it's an old module. It's not the best module in the world, I'll be honest with you. But what it's about is it's bridging from, it's, it's picking a load of things that are on the old Leaving Cert higher level syllabus and picking them up to kind of get you, if you're going to level seven, someone who has kind of the equivalent of higher level Leaving Cert. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's that. Oh yeah, so in, oh yeah, the other things, um, again, interrupt me at any time and email me any time as well. I'll, I answer emails every morning, seven days a week. Um, so in terms of like, what are we doing here with this, these notes? The PDF is in Canvas. I've had a bit of a disaster, which is that the copy center in CIT, uh, this is a 200 page document, is not open. And so you can't get this printed, which is really what you want because you want it all together. You've, it's a one-stop shop, it's a great job altogether. Um, you might be able to get it printed and bound somewhere outside CIT. I've sent a suggestion for that. You might have to print it at home. But the three things are you have a bound copy. That's great. The second is you print it off and you keep it together. But as you'll see, we, we write into these notes. Um, I will be sending on um, the annotated thing. So the, all this junk will be saved as a file and sent on every week. Um, but my opinion in maths is you want to be writing something as you're going. And the speed of this will be a little bit fast because we're not writing down everything. So if you just got a blank page in front of you, it might be a little bit difficult. I'm not sure what you're doing this evening. I'm sorry, it's just a mess with the manual. Like normally I would have emailed you and I think I did. Um, and people would have had the manual for tonight. But look, what can we do? Uh, it's a bit of a pain. Um, yeah. Right, let's have a little look at the material. So I think we're just gonna do a 25% test on each. Um, I think that's probably the easiest thing to do. And so we'll do the, the, the four, there's four chapters. They're pretty much similar length. And what I'll be trying to do is say, get down to here by week three. And then the test two weeks later. Similar for the matrix days, finish that by week six, test in week eight, differentiation, finish by week um, nine, test in week 11, and then integration uh, finished in week 12 or possibly a little bit earlier than week 12, and then a test in week 13, 25% uh, each, probably almost certainly, unless I have a think about it, uh, just be an online test. I'm, I might explore the idea of giving you homeworks instead. But the problem with that is it'd be a bit harder, um, which is probably not ideal. Like this is a module um, that you, you learn some stuff from me, sure, but a lot of this is just a case of uh, picking up maths to make you as if you've done higher level uh, leaving cert. Um, yeah. In terms of difficulty, yeah, most people who study work regularly, which means usually everyone in my class uh, gets true. I think I had one or two fails two years ago, but that, that's unusual. Um, this is one of the easier modules, certainly at, so in, in um, this, this is a second year module in say the day class, because I don't think it's the hardest out there. But I will say that the chapters get harder as they go along. So the vectors, in my opinion, and it's very funny, like as a lecturer, seem to really struggle to understand what students find hard and easy. So things that I think students should find really difficult often find it easy. And things that I think students should find easy, they find hard. But in my opinion, anyway, they get uh, it starts quite easy and gets harder. So if there's 25% tests, you like calling a spade a spade here, like we're in a difficult situation with the COVID, what you'll want to do is work very hard on the first two chapters and like you could be, you could be passed. Um, it's it's a sad state of affairs in that 
I, as far as I understand, I think 40 is as good as 70 for you. I don't know. I, I shouldn't say that, but maybe it is the case that 40 is as good as 70. But obviously the hope would be that you will um, still want to learn some things. And in fairness, the if you're going into level seven, the stuff in chapter four is important for um, the next year. So if you want to take a pragmatic approach, say, I just need to get this module done. You folks really hard on chapters one and two. You can learn some stuff in chapter three, but then you kind of refocus a little for chapter four. You're thinking more in terms of learning rather than passing exams. Um, yeah, so that's give you an idea that the chapters are fairly independent. So it's like it's a kind of a hodgepodge for different chapters. So that's, that's one reason I don't really like the module too much, but there's lots of lovely maths in it. Um, yeah. OK. Um, so what have we got? That's probably the you don't really need the email here and the website because we're going to be using Canvas. Um, module objectives, blah, 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 blah. Assessment to be decided. I, I'm almost certainly going to go for the 425% test. And if we no final exam, then I might go with the homework. We'll see, like if people, if everyone is submitting work and the work is high quality, uh, we might go with the homework. Um, so the usual crack with a kind of a homework versus a test is usually if students are able to do homework, the questions are harder, but because you have time to do it, if you're good enough, you can get really good marks, whereas you make little silly mistakes in the test. But if I feel, and it's more, it's likely that some of us, uh, you know, the maths we have to work hard on. And if there's a bit of that, yeah, look, I look, I probably, I probably look, I'm going to say it now, uh, it'll be four tests, it won't be the homeworks. I'd like to do the uh, homeworks, they're better, but uh, we're probably just going to go to this. Yeah. Um, Exercise, so how you study is you do exercises. That's how you get good at maths. You struggle with the exercises, submit your work, you get the feedback videos and hopefully things are uh, explained out. So you don't read notes, um, you don't watch videos, you do maths questions. Um, now there's a big long thing here about getting solutions. Now in this manual, there's loads of work solutions. We're gonna do work solutions. We're gonna do examples. There's more of them. Um, but in general, I've got a kind of an issue. You shouldn't really be working off examples. That's, you're not really learning anything there. You're just kind of copying. Um, that's not a really good way of learning. So no, there's not gonna be solutions to all the exercises given out. There's plenty of worked examples in there if you want. Uh, if you wanna read that, um, it's gone through. There is a, a suggestion here. Um, this class that this note was written about, they actually set themselves up with a WhatsApp. Um, now, obviously, there's concerns there um, about tests and security, and like I won't be taking any nonsense whatsoever in terms of plagiarism or anything like that. But um, if you can get some kind of online space where you can communicate, that can be good. Um, but having said that, when that class was there, they had no tutorials, they had no video feedback. They were live class, no tutorials at night. So actually, you don't need that class. Uh, what do we got here? So there's a website here, Matt Stack Exchange. Um, you probably don't need it again because you can ask me questions. You can email me questions at any time. And you can, in your when you're sending questions in or when you're sending in the work you've done, you can write any question there and I'll answer it. Um, we'll also, I forgot to say this, we will have Zoom um, Zooms before assessments, probably the week before. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll have a think about that. Um, we'll have a think about that, but I'd like to uh, give you a Q&A, like a live one uh, before assessment. So we'll probably look at that. So that what I'm going on about there doesn't matter. Blah, 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 blah. Um, this manual is very comprehensive. You shouldn't really need anything. Um, there are some references there, but to be honest, everything you need should be here or in Google. OK, so um, with that, like, I mean, we have three hours uh, tonight. We need to start. We can we need to start and actually do some maths. OK, so um, first chapter is on vectors. So let's get into this. Right. So laws of physics, which govern the universe and therefore engineering, uh, give you a distinction between scalar quantities and vector quantities. 
So it's not precise, but usually a scalar quantity is something that you only need one number to describe it. So the length of a beam, mass of a gas, how long it takes for a metal to cool or what temperature liquid, all those just need one number. Um, but not everything can be modeled so easily with just one number. So here's an example. Uh, when a sled is picked, pulled across the ice, there's a tension force and a friction force. And the question is kind of what is the net force? So we'll draw some uh, pictures here. We've got some blue ice. And we got um, a sled. And we have a tension force. We're going like that. And then we have a friction force. Now the friction comes from independently, kind of comes from the gravity as such, which is no gravity, which is no friction. So we have the gravity going down, which is mg. And then, so if you think about your, your Newton's second law, the force, some of the forces really is equal to mass times acceleration. Now, if you look at that sled, and if this is, this is basically the tension in the rope pulling it, as long as that tension isn't too big, if the tension is actually very, very big there, it, of course, it'll come off the ground. But imagine it's not strong enough to do that. Then the sled is going to go in that direction. Now, we'll put a little bit of um, uh, coordinates going on. So we're going to set this be the y direction plus, and this be the x direction plus. Now, if the sled is moving like this, the velocity or the speed in the y direction, it won't move up and down. So I'm saying the sled is moving along, but it doesn't move up and down. So the velocity in the y direction is zero. Now that means that the velocity is not changing. And if velocity is not changing, there's no acceleration. That means that the acceleration in the y direction is zero. And that means that if you look at the sum of the forces in a particular direction, say y, it'll be the mass times the acceleration in that direction. If the acceleration in the y direction is zero, then the sum of the forces in that direction must be zero as well. So what that means is if the forces, uh, and actually there's a bit more going on here because we've got a, a component of the tension force here, I'll call it Ty. I want that to be smaller than the gravity because if it's bigger than the gravity, the sled gets picked off the ground. So the tension force needs to be smaller. And I'm saying that in this situation, the up forces must match the down forces. And if we have that the tension force is less than the gravity, then we've got an issue because the, the, if the force in the y direction is to be zero, there's a force missing. And the missing force here is the reaction. Okay. And then it's, it's from the reaction that the friction happens. So the friction then goes like this. It's mu r. Okay. So the question here is kind of um, like, how do you describe the net force here? Um, now, actually, you can describe it in terms of one number because of the fact that it's just going along the x direction. But in general, actually, if you look at, if you look at the tension here, I'm going to draw an arrow in it. That needs two numbers to describe it. You could use the numbers of um, its magnitude, so how many newtons it is, and its direction. Maybe it's angle with the horizontal. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is you could describe it using how strong it is along the x direction and how strong it is along the y direction. Regardless, you need two numbers, at least more than one. So these are like vector, uh, these are vectors. So you can say they need more than one number to describe them. Or alternatively, you can say um, they have a magnitude, a strength, and a direction. Um, now, the directions can be funny because in three dimensions, a direction is two numbers. But we won't worry too much about that. So we're going to study vectors abstractly for a while. 
So um, it's just something that you need a couple of numbers to describe it. So it's just going to be a list of numbers at the moment. And then we'll get back to interpretations later. later. Um, you can think of not quite scalars, but real numbers as having a magnitude and direction. So if I take a real number, just means a number on the number line. So I'll just take a few, I'll just take say the number three and the number minus four. You could argue that these have a magnitude and direction. So the magnitude of three, which I'll call the absolute value of three is three. And you could say the direction of three is equal to plus. It's a bit silly, but you can do it. And similarly, you can say the magnitude of minus four, how big is minus four? It's four but the direction of minus four is minus. And um, so then you kind of get into a thing, is a scalar one number or is it a positive number? And we're kind of overdoing it there. Okay, in terms of why do you study vectors, um, I used to teach this to biomedical engineers. So this thing is up in here. Um, I think we have some kind of a picture. Yeah, so if you want to study, say, how people walk, um, you're looking at these different vectors. So I'm not sure, maybe these are how people are walking. So to describe say where the knee joint is going at every instant, it's velocity to be a speed. That's the magnitude of velocity and a direction. So these things, so the velocity of your knee, for example, is a vector and the position of your knee is a vector. Okay. Or another example could be fluid flow. Um, that may or may not be more applicable to what you're thinking about. So this is the thing where uh, if you imagine uh, a fluid flowing and you look at a particular point, well, the flu the, the, uh, at a, a certain instant, how the fluid is flowing is a vector. It has a magnitude, how fast it's going, and the direction, you know, pointing in the direction. Okay. So this is some vector stuff. We're going to be more interested in torques and moments and the work done by, of course. The big thing here, sorry, uh, is that a force is a vector because a force it has a direction and a magnitude, right? So we're going to try and do things geometrically and algebraically. So geometrically means a picture and algebraically just means we're doing numbers basically. And we're mostly going to be doing um, vectors in the plane. There are numbers that need two numbers to describe them, excuse me, vectors that need two numbers to describe them and vectors in space need three numbers to describe them. Okay, so a vector in the plane. Um, so usually, but not always, we'll have the vector coming from the origin, like that. Now, the thing about it is, it doesn't matter where it actually starts, that's not the important thing. So if I, and I'm crap at drawing, but if I could draw exactly the same kind of length arrow, the same direction, not bad, they're the same vector. It doesn't matter where they are, it's more, um, yeah, it's a bit more than that. So this vector here, now what we'll do is sometimes you'll see the V with a bold and that's to signify, it's not just like a single number. It, in this particular one, it's gonna be a pair of numbers or I'll probably start using the V with the arrow. Okay, um, now in terms of what are the two numbers, so the two numbers that describe this vector is, first of all, it's length, um, a length in, in, in the plane. So we use the bars, the bars. We use bars to signify, so that's the length of the vector. Now it's just a length between two points, or distance, I should say, between two points. That's all that is. And also the angle that it makes with the positive x-axis. So that's a magnitude and a direction. And I'll kind of call that the geometric picture, okay? Um, the proper language for this is this is the polar coordinates where you give it in terms of its length and direction. But there's an alternative, which we're calling the algebraic. Okay, so the magnitude is the length of the vector while the direction is the angle made with the positive. Yeah, we said that. Another way is to coordinate vectors. So another way is if you pick a point, point, 
And let's say it's the point A along the X and B along the Y, then you can say that that pair of numbers implicitly defines a vector going from the origin to it. So in that sense, what we're kind of saying is that um, the vector V can also be given by a point P, which should be A along the X, B along the Y. So this is um, what you might call the algebra you're giving in terms of numbers. Now, just to be clear, this distance here is A, that's the distance along the X, and this distance here is B. Um, now, to be careful, if it went down, it, it could be a negative number, it could be negative B, something like that. Um, and the fancy way of calling these, so these are, these are these algebraic things, these are called Cartesian coordinates. And they're obviously the same things, just you get different numbers, different pairs of numbers. Like you could, the, the way that this, you could write, you can make them kind of quite kind of similar by writing the vector here as magnitude and direction like that. But obviously that they're different coordinates. Like if you put down, like say for example here, I could take the point given by, let's put actual some numbers on this, say minus three, two, and this little vector here in the Cartesian coordinates would be minus three along the X, two along the Y, but you can't like minus three, two above doesn't make any sense because you can't have a length of minus three. Okay. Uh, that should be a bit confusing and silly, that little thing. Okay. So what we want to be able to do is to be able to convert between the two of them. If you know um, the Cartesian coordinates, can you find the magnitude and direction? And if you know the magnitude and direction, can you find the coordinates? We want to be able to go to, between the two of them. Okay. So uh, we'll be using a lot of pictures through this. So what we're gonna do here is I think, if we know the magnitude of the vector and the direction, can we find the angle? I think that's what we're gonna do first, yeah. So now I, I'm gonna draw the things in what's called the positive uh, quadrant. You're gonna, you're gonna see it. Things are a little bit different, but you can fix them if you go into other quadrants. So here's a vector V. So if I went over here, the angle, um, what I'm getting at here is the angle is with the positive x-axis, and that has to be adjusted if the angle comes, comes out somewhere else. So there's the positive x-axis, uh, and the angle is what's made with it. So if the vector went over in, say, this direction, the angle will be all of that, the angle that makes it the positive x, okay? So um, let's say as well that this vector, the original one we drew, had a length of v. So the question is, from that information, oh, sorry. Uh, should be colors. I want to find the coordinates of this point. So can I find the coordinates of this? In other words, given that information, can I find how long this side length is and how long this side length is? And what we do is just do a bit of trigonometry to find this. So if we drop the perpendicular as I did there, we can find A and B with some um, right angle triangle uh, trigonometry. Now remember as well, you, you can stop me at any time, ask questions, unmute yourself and shout. So we'll start with the cosine of theta. So we've got, I'll just do some labeling just in case you forget some of this stuff. Um, we have, in terms of this angle, this is the adjacent, I just write A, this is the opposite, and this is the hypotenuse. And the cosine is the ratio of the um, adjacent, sorry, it keeps messing me around this show. I hope this last time this happens. Uh, 
doesn't matter, does it? Right. Um, so where were we? So the cos of theta is equal to the adjacent, which is A, divided by the hypotenuse. And the hypotenuse is um, the length of V. And if I want, I'm looking for A from, so I'm pretending that I know theta, I know the length of V, I can find A. So I've got the vision by the magnitude of V. If I multiply both sides, by the magnitude of V, I end up with A is equal to the magnitude of V times cos of theta. So if I know, in other words, the length of the vector and the angle, I can use this little thing here to find out the X coordinate. And similar story, if you do the same thing with Stein, the B is equal to the magnitude of V times sine of theta. So you have the following fact. Uh, a plane geometric vector v of magnitude v and direction theta has this coordinate form. So the x coordinate is v cos and the y coordinate is magnitude of v sine. Okay. Um, so going from the coordinate to the geometric isn't too difficult. Um, and that's probably more what we'll be doing. Let's see. So what we want to do now is we know the coordinates of the vector. Can we find the length, et cetera? So again, we'll draw a vector. Sorry. What am I trying to do here? Oh yeah, I'm pretending that I have the coordinates of it. So the vector is given as Cartesian coordinates, A and B. So if I drop a perpendicular here, A, sorry, perpendicular here. And this length is A, this length is B. And remember this uh, length here is the magnitude of the vector. Okay, now what I can do is I can do the Pythagoras in this yoke to find the length of V. So I'm pretending now I know A and B. Okay. Um, so let's see how it'll go. So doing Pythagoras on this, it says the square of the hypotenuse, square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. Now, something we're gonna talk about a little bit later when we do some little bits of algebra. When you have a square, in general, there's two solutions. So we're gonna take a square root, but we have to be careful, there's two solutions. So we, we would be careful about that. So if I do the square root of both sides, um, I could naively just say that the square root would get rid of the square. But then the thing about the two solutions, where does that come in? And in general, where that comes in is if you're doing a square root like in this scenario, um, plus or minus will work. I'll do a little easier example of that in a second. Uh, I'll just show, I'll just do an example like that down below here. So if you have say x squared equal to four and you do the square root of both sides and you get x is equal to the square root of four, you just get plus two. But there's actually two numbers that square to give you four, plus two and minus two. So you just have to be careful to include plus or minus. So when you've got a square here, just two solutions. But here it's a little bit different because in fact, um, this is a length, it can't be negative. So actually you can throw out that thing. So there's only the, the positive one. And it's probably worth commenting that um, this square root, you cannot say that this is the same as A plus B, they're not the same. So like think about it, when you travel from here to here, that, sorry, uh, when you travel from here to here, that distance is smaller than traveling first to here and then to here. So this distance is not equal to A plus B. Okay. And so that's how you find the magnitude of a vector. You just do, it's called, we'll call it the Pythagoras formula, square root sum of the squares. Now there's no nice formula for the direction. So what you do to find the direction is you draw a picture. 
Um, so for example, suppose our vector looks something like this. I've deliberately gone into that second quadrant to make it a bit more complicated. Um, what you would do in this scenario, so this would be the direction, the, direction, uh, the angle with the positive x-axis. Um, and actually, I'm going to put actual numbers on this one. So let's say this is uh, minus 8 along the x and 9 along the y for argument's sake. Okay. So how you would find this angle is you'd actually find the angle um, on the other side, which would be this, which I'm going to call alpha. Okay. And you'd find it by dropping this here, going like this. And there's two options. Now, um, are we finding this angle? There's different ways of doing it. So you just do it whatever suits. And here, what suits at the moment is you could probably use the, find the tan of the angle, alpha. Okay, so tan is opposite over adjacent. Now, in terms of length, so this is nine. And this length, if you go from zero to minus eight, it has a length of eight. So this is, the nine is opposite, the eight is adjacent, the tan of alpha is equal to nine over eight. If you wanna get alpha on its own, now you might be, well, why am I looking at alpha? Well, what I'm gonna do is, theta is 180 degrees, the full thing, take away alpha, that's how you find theta. So if I do inverse tan on both sides here, I'll use my calculator. I'll do it just to um, three significant figures. So uh, or do four significant figures. Inverse tan of nine over eight, uh, 48.37. And therefore the angle theta is the full 180 degrees minus the 48.37 degrees, which gives me um, whatever, 131.6, if I do four significant figures. There's probably a small thing I should say. So I'm gonna use this kind of symbol here um, to specify that I've only approximated it. It's not exactly equal to 48.37, that's a decimal approximation. And so I probably should say that this is approximate as well. Okay, so that's how you find the, the angle. Uh, usually um, we're just gonna be interested in the magnitude as it happens. Right, so that's your vectors in- um... Excuse me, JP. Yeah. Sorry for, for the, uh, this is Jack here. Um, uh, uh, good, thanks. Um, for these maths questions, should we be in degrees or radians? Okay. Yeah. This is an excellent question, right? So I've, I've very handily there gone to degrees, right? Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna answer it over here, right? In two ways. So what you can definitely do is always use radians. That's the first option. Okay. The second thing you can do is you can use degrees when you can use degrees. And the question is when can you use degrees and not? Probably the easier thing to say when you and not use degrees where you have to use radians. Um, so, but uh, definitely have to use radians when. Whenever you're doing stuff with differentiation or with anti-differentiation, you have to use radians. And the reason for that is, if, if I asked you, what's the derivative of sine of x? And you told me the derivative of sine of x is cos of x. That's correct. But if you, if I asked you for the derivative of sine of x degrees, the derivative is not cos of x degrees. It's, it's something like cos of x by pi over 180 or cos of x by 180 over pi. It's just messy. So the point, what I'm getting at here is uh, if you're doing any calculus, that's differentiation and integration, you have to use radians. And um, 
because you'll be using stuff like derivatives, sinus costs, but that's only true for radians. So in terms of this module, if you want, you always use radians. Alternatively, you can use degrees in chapter one and then radians in chapters three and four. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so degrees are okay here, but not later. Okay. Um, everything we're gonna, we're gonna uh, generalize this. Now, when you go into space, um, the geometric picture, which is the, um, the magnitude is fine, direction is complicated. How do you describe a direction in space? It's kind of complicated. Uh, and you'll see that actually the algebraic picture is easier where you just listen the numbers. So, and we're actually not going to be examining this. So I'm just gonna mention it very briefly, but this is how you describe a direction in space. If I was in the classroom, I'd be moving around and everything here. Um, yeah, we'll do it here anyway. So what you do is, so you have your vector, which here is called R. And what you do is, so this is, I hope you understand this is in space. So if I'm thinking about this now, usually, what I do is this will be some corner of the room. And this is going up the corner of the room. Z is going up the corner of the room. Um, X is going one direction and Y is going in another. So like looking at it from above. Y and X are uh, perpendicular. It's a corner of the room. So I hope you can kind of understand um, what that picture is saying. So when um, you have a vector in space, so this is going from the corner of the room to somewhere in the room. I used to use the, um, the, the projector was the point. So the vector that goes from the corner of the room up to the projector, it's a perfectly good vector. To describe the direct, now the distance is easy. You will see that in a minute, but the direction is hard. So what you do is you project downwards, you go straight down. And so you kind of get this vector in the X, Y plane. So it's kind of like a shadow. So look from above and project down, you get something like this. And then this little verify thing is that angle there. So that's the first direction. Um, I think that might be called the azimuthal angle or something. And then you have another angle, which is the angle between the vector and the uh, vertical. So it's kind of confusing. We don't really actually have to worry about it too much for us, but that, that's, how you, that's how you describe the direction anyway. Um, what's a lot easier to describe this vector here is you say, okay, um, how do I get from the corner of the room to imagine this is the projector there, so that's the thing. So you're going to travel along the wall a certain distance. That's the X coordinate. Then you're going to travel perpendicular to that in the Y direction. That is the Y coordinate. And then how far up do you go? That will be the Z. Now that can't be drawn in the picture on the right. So the distance along the X, a distance along the y, a distance along the z, and so in Cartesian coordinates, r can be written as a, b, c. Certain distance along the x, certain distance along the y, certain distance along the z. Okay. So that's what we're going to do down here now. Um, the picture there is probably a little bit better, but we'll draw it here. So again, you're kind of imagining the corner of the room is here, and here's a vector going somewhere into the room. So how do you get there? I'm just going to repeat what I said. You travel along the x-axis. Actually, if, if I draw the perpendicular, that be helps. So you travel along the x-axis a certain distance. You travel along the y direction a certain distance, and then you go straight a certain distance. So a along the x, b along the y, c along the z. You get a vector here, a vector b, a, b. C. Okay, hopefully there's some kind of sense to that. Uh, so if you pick a point in space, then this gives you a vector. Now, this is probably a small thing I should, just in case you might see it here or there. So, so if, I, if I write down a point, the way it defines a vector is you go from the origin to that point. So um, you can write down OP 
is the vector from O, the origin to P. That's how you can write that down. Okay. Uh, so coordinate space vectors are three numbers. Um, I won't go through this, but this is basically describing how you go from um, these kind of angles to ABC. I think it's done there, but it's it's not examinable. I'm not I'm not too bothered by it, but it can be done. Okay. Now what we will do is we will ask you to find the length of a vector in space. So it turns out that it's just square root sum of the squares. And we'll just show you where that comes from. So take our vector of the form ABC. Uh, to figure out what's going on with it, we will uh, project down. Okay, so that's supposed to go to the floor or such. Um, and let's do some calculations. Sorry, that's a terrible drawing, right? But uh, what it's supposed to be doing is it's making a right angle triangle. Now that might look like a right angle triangle, but it is. Like if you imagine this uh, down here at the origin is the corner of the room. And what you're doing is you're walking along, right along the wall, and then you're turning 90 degrees and then walking into the room. It is actually a right angle triangle. Now this is length A, and this is length B, and we'll call this yoke, um, or we'll just call it P. And we'll do a little Pythagoras there. The P is actually the hypotenuse. So um, P squared is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Okay, and now what we'll do is we'll do another Pythagoras. Sorry, um, the changing of the color is, 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 is blocking you off the whole time, isn't it? I, I, may, I might just stick to um, a neutral enough color. We'll stick with blue there. Sorry about that. Um, so we've got another right angle right, triangle. Right. Yeah? Uh, it's just Ryan there. If it was in yeah. state, how would you choose an origin? Say again? As in, the, if it was in space, how would you choose the origin? You you choose that, yeah. So you, okay. you you choose, yeah. So so some of the things that you control when you're setting up any kind of a problem is you choose the origin, you pick the directions. Now there should be a relationship between the x, y, and the z. Um, I think it's called the right hand rule. So we'll see about that a bit later. So um, what is a, like? See the way the x is here and the Y is here and the Z is up. If you swap them around, the Z would have to go down. Right, so that, but apart no. from that, you control things. So you pick the origin, you pick what direction is plus. So for example, say if you're doing a problem with the sled, like you pick where the sled starts to be the origin and you pick the direction of the sled to be positive. So unless it's given to you, you pick the origin. And this is in the real world. Like, so for example, for the people who are doing the gait analysis in the lab, so you're, you're analyzing how people walk, they'll, they'll just ch chuck some sensor somewhere and that's the origin. So uh, you choose that essentially. No, no. Okay. Um, now we're looking at this triangle. Now I'll, I'll just I'll maybe just use some notation. So we'll call this O, we'll call this the point uh, a, a Q and this the point R. So what we're interested in finding here is the length of this vector, which is the hypotenuse of this little triangle. We've got, we've got P squared in terms of A and B, and then this height is C. So if we do a Pythagoras, so we're looking in the right angle triangle, uh, OQR. If we do a little Pythagoras there, we get the magnitude of V squared, square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. So we get P squared plus C squared. And then we notice that P squared is actually equal to A squared plus B squared plus, sorry, P squared is equal to A squared plus B squared. And so we're in a similar situation to before where we just have to take the square root of both sides and we get that the length of the vector is the square root of the sum of the squares. And the algebra problem there is two solutions plus minus. 
but the magnitude of the vector is positive, so you just take the positive one. So that's just a little proof of this little formula here. So the length of a vector in space is square root some of the square root of Pythagoras theorem in space. Okay. Um, okay, all the stuff down here is what we wrote on the left. So we don't need that. Okay, so let's look at uh, exam questions. They're not going to be too scary. I, I, actually, I'm, I'm sorry now, I'm, colors, I'm being annoying. It was a nice color, I think. Go on. Ah, sorry. All right. Um, so here's a question. Find the magnitude of the vector. Simple. You do Pythagoras says the magnitude of the vector is square root sum of the squares. Now there is one thing to look out for here, and that's you have to be a little bit careful when you're squaring the minus seven. So if you're going into the calculator, what you don't want to do, well, I'll do it, yeah, um, we'll do it over here. So, yeah. So if you just write, even if you're a plus minus seven squared and you put that into the calculator, you're gonna get an issue because minus seven squared, if you write it like that, it doesn't mean what you think it means because that means it's not equal to minus seven multiplied by minus seven, which is what squaring should be. So you're not getting 49 because in BEMDAS, so it's brackets first and then the E is exponents. It does the squaring before the multiplied by minus one. So you end up with this thing being equal to, so you square first seven squared is 49 by minus, you get minus 49. So how you have to fix this is you put brackets around the minus seven if you're going into the calculator. And that's equal to whatever, um, 49, 58, square root of 62. Okay. Now, if a mathematician will just leave it as the square root of 62, um, as an engineer, you might want to find it as a, as, a, as a decimal, and that's fine. I recommend four significant figures. So, you get the first non-zero number and then three more and round the last one if necessary. So if I go into the calculator, I get like 7.87400, whatever. So I do the first number is seven, um, point, next number is eight, seven, and then the four, um, and then after the four is a zero, so I don't round it. So if you want to do a decimal approximation, that's what I'd like, and it's nice to use this symbol here. Okay. Um, right, we can add vectors together, um, just like you can add forces together. So have a look. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll change colors when it doesn't block stuff, hopefully. <laughs> so um, say you've got two geometric vectors. So say this is A looks something like that. And say, um, B looks something like, I'm gonna make it a bit easy for myself, up like that. So the sum, what you do is you kind of imagine you do A and then you do B. So you just put, so you imagine doing A and now do B, what does B do? It goes up by this much. And then the vector that is um, from here to here is A plus B. So I just kind of moved the, or placed the B vector over here. And then the, the, the what's called the resultant, that's the sum of them. Um, okay, uh, you can also do it, it's pretty much the same thing. So if I added on an A onto uh, B as well, I would end up with a kind of a parallelogram. So that's like this next picture down here. So another completely equivalent way is something like this. So you've got a vector B, you've got a vector A. If you add B kind of onto A and A onto B, you get the same thing. And that's saying that really kind of A plus B is the same as B plus A. So the R vector here is A plus B. And it kind of geometrically anyway describes how you add vectors and the forces or whatever. So 
Um, yeah. So a little example here, not too bad. Uh, so let A be given by two, three, and B be given by minus three, four. Sketch A and B, show how the triangular, it's just triangle, triangle law is used to calculate A plus B. So we draw a picture. Um, a is this thing. So it goes from the origin to two along the X, three along the Y. And B um, is minus three, four. So that's this point over here. So this is A and this is B. And then show how the triangle law. So I just have to put an A on top of a B. So look what A does. It goes across two and up three. So the, the coordinate here for B is minus three, four. It's going to, A goes over by two. So it's gonna go over from minus three to one and it goes up by three. So it's gonna go from four to seven. And of course, if you add on the B onto A instead, you get the same thing. Um, now, what you get here is the triangle law, just looking at this, it shows actually how easy it is to add them when they're algebraically given by numbers. So if we look uh, at A plus B here, so we've got A was given as two along the X, three along the Y. B was given as minus three along the X, four along the Y and A plus B, what happened? Well, let's look at the X coordinate. Uh, now it's actually B plus A, but it's the same thing. So we're at minus three and A went over by two. So we did plus two. And in terms of Y, we were at four. And what does A do in the Y direction? It goes up three, so we added three. And so we ended up with this minus one along the X, seven along the Y. And look how easy it is. You're just adding up these numbers here. So A plus B, you just add up the X's, two plus minus three gives you minus one, and three plus four gives you seven. So adding vectors is very, very easy. They're, they're kind of made to be added to be honest. Okay, so yeah, that's that. Uh, you just see a picture and you see kind of what's, it's, yeah, nothing going on there really. Uh, this shows how easy it is to add uh, vectors in the coordinate picture. So for example, if you have the vector on the plane two, three plus vector minus one, seven, you just add them component wise. Uh, and it's important to say that when you add vectors, you don't get a number, you get another vector. So the two plus the minus one gives us one and the three plus the seven gives us 10. And it works exactly the same in space. So say if you got one, zero, uh, minus three, plus the vector seven, uh, two, five, similar story, you just add them component wise. So you add the X's together, the one plus the seven giving you eight, the zero plus the two giving you two, and the minus three plus the five giving you uh, two. So no problems there, hopefully. Um, the other thing you can do with a vector is multiply it by a scalar. You can, and that's where scale come, uh, scalar scales it. Okay. So what are we going to here? So if we have a vector, uh, say v, I can multiply it by an, a real number. So there's various different things you can, actually. I'm going to scratch that one. It's too. I need a smaller one. So if I multiply it by a number smaller than one, it shrinks it. So say, it could be half V, shrinks it. Multiply it by a number bigger than one, it stretches it. So this might be three V. If I multiply it by a negative number, it changes the direction. So if I multiply by minus two, the minus changes the direction and the two stretches it. Yeah. 
So you can talk about doubling a force. Um, it'll be the same direction, but the magnitude will be twice as big. Okay. Uh, that's in the geometric picture. So multiplying by a scalar just changes the magnitude, not the direction. If the uh, and then it'll either stretch it or um, shrink it, and it can change the uh, direction. So this leads us to the, consider the following. Um, so I think what we're going to do here is we're going to, yeah. So we're going to we're going to show that you can write every vector in the plane anyway, in terms of these two vectors down here, one, zero, and zero, one. So I think I'll do this with a specific vector, say three along the X, four along the Y. So uh, I'll drop a little perpendicular here. Okay, and we got this face. So the first thing is by the, the triangle law, this vector V is a sum of a horizontal bit and a vertical bit. So let's say that V is equal to the horizontal bit is three along the X and zero along the Y. And the vertical bit is it goes, it doesn't move along the X and it goes straight up along the four, along the Y, excuse me. Um, now what we can do then is we can chop this little, the, the, the horizontal vector into three pieces, or rather we can just take this vector here, that's, that's not a good picture, something like this. So this vector here is one along the X, zero along the Y. And if we multiply that by three, we get the full horizontal vector. So what we, what we what it means is that the tree zero is three times one zero. So one zero means one along the X, multiplied by three, we get three along the X. And similar story, take this vector here, this length four vector and chop it into four pieces. This vector here that goes from here to here is one along the y. Sorry, I shouldn't be going that. So that's zero along the x, one along the y. So this vertical bit is four times zero one. And what that means is that every vector, and you can kind of do, do similar, is written in terms of one zero and zero one. So we give these things special names. We call this thing i hat, and this thing we call it j hat. Now you'll see why soon, um, why we give it this hat. And I'll also say that this notation, which is rampant in maths, it's, it's a bad notation. What we should have done, but we don't, is we should call it x hat. So the hat means a length of one, and then it, so it means i hat means one in the x direction. And then the j hat could really be written as y hat. Um, or maybe not. Okay. So basically, what I'm saying here is that any vector in the plane, say AB, can be written as AI plus um, BJ hat. Okay. So it's A along the X plus B along the Y. And I means one along the X and J means one along the Y. So you can write everything in terms of I and J. So if you see this, it means this. And if you see this, it means this. Okay. And the I's and J's will be very useful to us eventually. You can do a similar story with uh, vectors in space. So if this is A along the X, well, let's, let's do it with specific numbers. Let's say uh, seven along the X, uh, six along the Y, four along the Z. So this vector is made up of seven, a distance seven along the X. So take this, 
this would be seven along the X, seven, zero, zero. Going across here, this is supposed to be six along the Y. And then this vector here is supposed to be four along the Z. So the vector, the red vector there, the seven, six, four is equal to the seven, zero, zero plus the zero, six, zero plus the zero, zero, four. And what we can do is we can take little vectors i, that's one along the x. So seven i gives you the seven zero zero. You can call a vector j, that's one along the y. And then what we call one along the z direction, we call a uh, k. So every vector in space is a sum of i, i's, j's, k's. In particular here, we have that 764. That means the same thing as 7 times i, just means 7 along the x, plus 6j, which just means 6 along the y, plus 4k, which just means um, 4 along the z. And the hats is about the lengths of them. So the length of i hat is 1. The length of, and it's the same as the length of um, j hat and k hat. The hat is going to be our notation for length one vector. Okay. Um, so everything, yeah, in space is a, a sum of i, j, k. So uh, it'd be useful to use those i, j, k's in different contexts later on. So we write, well, we've done it already. Say seven six four, we can write it as seven i plus six j plus four k. Okay. So uh, say here's a question: um, find the magnitude of the vector three i plus four j plus two k. All you have to do is just recognize that the three four two are the distances along the x y z. So it's going to be square root sum of the squares of the three four two. So the magnitude of this vector, which we could write as magnitude of 3i hat plus 4j hat plus 2k hat is equal to square root sum of the squares. Now the magnitude is a single number, describing the length. So that's 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 2 squared. Uh, I think that might be square root of 29 which again, if you're so inclined, you could do a decimal approximation at 5.385, approximately 5.385. Okay, um, I think we might have a, a break for 20 minutes at this point, if that's okay. So uh, we'll be back at uh, 20, 36, you can have a cup of tea or whatever. So obviously you don't have this, you can do your own breaks if you go for the offline or whatever. Okay, is that fair enough? Uh, we'll see you then.
Okay, folks, we're uh, back. Um, so we'll just we'll just maybe just go over a few things. Uh, um, just so you get a kind of picture in your head of what's going on and what's been important, and what's not so important. So we can make vectors certainly in the plane. Um, yeah, maybe the real focus is on the Cartesian one. So if you've got a pair of numbers that defines a vector in the plane, if you have, um, yeah, we're not too interested actually in the magnitude and direction. Well, the magnitude we are, we're mostly gonna be working with vectors in space of this form where it's given in terms of distance along the X, distance along the Y, distance along the Z. And we have a Pythagoras theorem for finding the length of such vectors we do square root sum of the squares. Yeah, I think like actually most of the things we're going to do are going to be vectors in the space. Um, we can add vectors together and it's actually quite easy. You just add the X components, the Y components, the Z components together. So that's no problem. You can scalar multiply things. And what's probably not written down here is that if you want to multiply, say, this vector here by three, you multiply all of the components by three. So we probably, I didn't actually explicitly write that down, but that is how it works. And using that, we can write every vector in space in terms of i, j, k. Uh, yeah. Okay, my little example. So now we're, we're back. Okay, so now what we're gonna do now is when we have a vector, can we find a vector in the same direction with a length of one? Okay, so Say we have a vector here, V, and suppose this has a length of five. So what I want to do is get a vector, uh, which I'll call V hat. That is in the same direction as V, but as a length of just one. So the length of V, is equal to five. So it's set up in such a way here, certainly the way we've done it, is that five of these little V hats five of these little V hats, five of these little blue things is the same as the vector V. And what you can do is um, multiply both sides by a fifth or this multiply both sides or uh, divide both sides by five to get that V hat is the vector V divided by five. Now we haven't said that you can divide a vector by a number, but you can because dividing by five is multiplying by one fifth. So that's no problem. So actually the, um, the v vector V hat, how do you get a vector in the same direction is you take the original vector and divide it by its own length. That new vector will then have a, a length of one. And because you have, you're multiplying by a positive number essentially, because say, say multiplying or dividing by five is multiplying by one fifth, that's positive. It's not going to change the direction. So you have the same direction, but a magnitude of one. So this is, uh, it'll probably be written up in the next page. Yeah. So v hat, which is equal to the vector divided by its own length is the unit vector in the direction of v. Now I have a little thing here, if you wanna play around, uh, you can go to this at some stage. I don't know that link may or may not be live on the thing you download, probably not. But uh, if, if you've got the patience to put that into a browser, you, there's, I've written a little app that you can just play around or does, you can change the vector and you can see where the unit vector is, okay. Um, next thing that we might be interested in is a vector of a given magnitude in a given direction. Uh, this will become a little bit more important later on. So we probably should draw a picture of this. So picture would look something like this. Say you have a, a direction given by a vector u. because every vector defines a direction apart from the zero vector. And say you want a vector in the same direction of 
of length, say three, for argument's sake. So this is we'll this we call this thing um, vector v, and let's say its length is three, for argument's sake. So how do you get from u, which has its own length, let's just say for argument's sake, we'll say the length of um, u is five to v. Now you could mess around and say something like, if, I'm, if I find three fifths, I think that would actually work. I'll write that over here on the left because it, it's something we can run with. So um, v would be three fifths of u. But what if the kind of numbers are kind of messy? Yeah, it's a, bit, it's a little bit messy. We can write a little bit more down actually there. So that is the uh, length of v by u over the length of u. And it seems a bit kind of confused, like there's not much feeling to that and understanding. But what you want to do actually is break it down a little bit. Go from the vector u to u hat. So find u hat, which is the length of one. So if I just write the length of this, this is the length of one. And then multiply u hat, u hat by three. It'll be in the correct um, direction and it'll have the correct length. So, it, so basically what I'm saying is rather than um, doing this thing over on the left, which is perfectly valid, is actually first you find the unit vector and then multiply the unit vector of u by the length of v that you want. That's probably the way to do it. And if you actually look at these, if you substitute this into this, you'll see that it's actually the same formula. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So let's see an example of this. And this one is done out more or less completely. So find the vector v, which has a magnitude of 40 and is in the direction of this thing. So um, let's call um, let's call this thing. So I do that u. So um, we can probably even, can we edit this thing? Yeah, so we'll just, uh, no, we won't edit it, but we'll, we'll draw the same picture over here. So we've got a vector, uh, which I'm calling u. Um, and I want a vector v that's in the same direction that has a length of 40. So how I'm going to find this vector v is I'm going to find a u hat. So that's length one in the correct direction and then multiply that by 40. Okay. So first thing I'm going to do is find u hat. So to find u hat, I divide u by its own length. So here's u. So I need to divide this by its own length. So to find the length, I do Pythagoras square root some of the squares square root of two squared plus three squared, and then being careful with that minus six, uh, that's the square root of 49, which is seven. And so u hat is take the original vector u and divide it by its own length, divided by seven. So you get this. Now, if you want, you can divide in that seven. So you could, there's no real value to doing it, but you could do it. So this is two sevens, three sevens, minus six, seven. So as I was saying, um, if you're multiplying a vector by a number, you multiply all of them by the number. So similarly, if you're dividing a vector by a number, in this case, seven, you divide all the components by seven, okay? So that's the little u hat here, over here. So v would be 40 times that. So it's obviously not the scale, but 40 of these little u hats gives you v. And remember, it doesn't matter where the vector actually is. It's, uh, it's all in relation to a, um, some, uh, oh, some um, uh, axis, x, y, z. Sorry, just the joke here is messing around. All right, um, so I just need to multiply this by 40. So here we go, there's 40 by u hat. I could do the 40 divided by seven, put that together and then multiply in, you get something like this. Uh, you can use that notation or you can use that notation, it's the same thing. They, they mean, of course, the same thing. Because this means 80 over seven uh, in the X, 120 over seven in the Y, et cetera. And that is exactly the same as this. 
So that's just something you might have to do in a question where you'll have a, a vector that describes a direction and you want, so for example, you describe the direction and you want another vector that's the same direction, but a different length. Usually what you'll do is you'll find the unit vector and then multiply that up to the length you want. Okay. Um, maybe that's one of the trickier things we've done so far. Um, displacement vector. So this is the situation where you're analyzing people walking. Um, so you have a sensor at one point in the room. That's probably the origin, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe a slightly different thing we're talking about. So maybe you're interested in, we'll just draw an I'll stick person there. I'm going to give them a bit of a shoulder. Right. And a bit of a knee. All right. And you might be interested in the vector from the knee. It looks like an elbow, but it's meant to be a shoulder. So this little vector here. Oh, sorry that goes from the knee to the shoulder. That might be something you might be interested in. So where you've got two points, you want the vector from one point to the other. So uh, how does this work? So if you have a point P and a point Q, and we're talking about the vector from P to Q. Now those points, those coordinates, of course, are given um, in terms of some coordinate system, x, y, z. Okay, and what, how we figure out how to find the vector from p to q is we form the vector. So they make the point p into a vector op, which we'll just call p, and you make the point q into a vector oq, which we'll just call Q. So this becomes the vector P and this becomes the vector Q. And if you look at the triangle, if you do um, the vector Q, so that's from O to Q, that is exactly the same. So going to Q in terms of not in terms of a length, but in terms of vector is the same as going to P first and then going from P to Q. So uh, when I say, oh, then you go, that means you're adding the vectors. So the vector Q from the origin to Q as a vector is the same as going to P and then from P to Q. And all you have to do then is take away P from both sides and you end up with the vector from P to Q is equal to, so take away P from both sides, um, you get Q minus P. Now, one thing I might just say, often when I give a, um, a vector given by a point, I might write P with a line underneath. So this means the vector from the origin to P. Now I could just write P with an arrow instead. Um, it's just some small salt, they don't really matter. You could write the hat on top. So really I should write um, maybe lines underneath these, but it's, it's really not a big deal. You'll see in examples. Now, the only thing in terms of remembering this is the vector from P to Q, um, it's the second minus the first, okay? I think we'll see an example now on the next page. Okay, here we got a, a bigger enough example. Right, so we've got a vector U and a vector V, and we've got a, a good few questions here. Are any of them related to the space and vector? No, they're not. Um, oh, there is going to be a link. Okay, so calculate v minus u. Now, the subtraction of vectors works just like you think. Uh, the unit vector, okay, okay, let's go. So let's do v minus u. So this works exactly like you think it works. So v minus u, you just have to be very careful with the sign. I'll write in the v's and the u's. So you see the ijk's? If you want, you can go to the coordinates where the coordinates are written in the brackets. So v is minus four along the x, 2j means two along the y, minus 4k means minus four along the z. So that's v minus u is four along the x, minus one along the y, and one along the z. 
And then you just be careful here. So minus four, minus four. So the subtraction works pretty much just like addition. You do it component wise. Minus four, minus four is minus eight. Two minus minus one is two plus one is three. And minus four minus one is minus five. So that's V minus U. Next question is find a unit vector in the same direction as this. So to get a unit vector in the same direction, you just take this vector here and divide it by its own length. Okay. So um, we should find the length of V minus U. Because we're trying to find a unit vector in the direction of this. So that's the same as finding the length of the vector minus eight, three, minus five. We do Pythagoras, careful with the signs. So it's square root, sum of the squares, minus eight squared plus three squared plus minus five squared. So that would be 64, 73, I think it's square root of 98. Uh, yeah. Now, I, I, I'm just going to, on this one, I'm just going to keep the square root of 98 because I'm not going to divide that in or anything like that. So I've got the vector V minus U, I've got its length, and so I can form the vector V minus U hat, which is a vector in the same direction as V minus U with a length of one. How do you find that? You do the vector V minus U divided by its own length. So that's uh, minus eight, three, minus five, divided by its own length, which is the square root of 98. And I would just leave it like that. If you want, you can divide in the square root of 98. If you want, you could do minus eight over square root of 98 and do four significant, four, four significant figure rounding or whatever. But uh, I'd be happy enough with that. Okay, that's the first two bits. And uh, the second bit says, investigate whether or not the length of V minus U is equal to the length of U plus the length of V. So we'll just investigate this. So what we're gonna do is we've, we've already calculated this. So we'll calculate this, we'll calculate this, and we'll, we'll add them together and compare with um, the length we found, which is square root of 98. So we're investigating whether these two things are equal. So the length of U, Let's see, length of u, so the vector u is uh, up here. Well, I'll see, like it's back there, minus four, two, minus four, but it's, it's same thing as this. Ah, oh, sorry, no, it's actually not there. All right, so that's square root, some of the squares, four squared plus minus one squared plus one squared, that is the square root of 18. And the length of V is, now this is V here. So I'll do Pythagoras to that. Square root minus four squared plus two squared plus minus four squared. You can bang that into the calculator and you will get six. Okay. So, we're, we're investigating whether how the sum of those compares with the square root of 98. So what we'll probably do is uh, just let's write down that the length of u um, plus the length of v, which is equal to square root of 18 plus six. And let's approximate that on the calculator to four significant figures. I guess um, 10.24. And if I go back and estimate the square root of 98 using the calculator, well, that's going to be less than 10 at any rate. I get 9.899. So these two, the length of V minus U and the length of U plus the length of V could not possibly be equal. Um, the length of V minus U is smaller. So this is not equal to, uh, here we can say, therefore, the length of U plus 
v here is not equal to the length of v minus here. Because in particular, one is bigger than 10 and one is smaller than 10. Okay. So, yeah, and remember, anytime you can interrupt um, for questions, um, if, if, if we don't go to live, of course, you'll be getting feedback on your work or probably a lot of your questions because you'll, you'll show your confusion in the work you do and they'll be addressed there. Um, otherwise, you can always email. Now, this last question is actually quite of a difficult question. Uh, I, I think when I, I gave this in a, in a test, I don't think anyone actually got it. So the following is known as the triangle inequality, that the length of V minus U is less than or equal to the length of U plus the length of V. So this is actually always true. And the, the idea was to um, draw a picture to show this. And the bit that's missing, that people didn't quite put the two sticks together. What did we do on the previous page? Like we said, we had a vector on the previous page, a vector from P to Q is the same as the point Q minus the point P. But points and vectors are kind of the same thing. So if you have two vectors, start them off at the same point, say the origin, then you can talk about the vector from U to V, where it means the tip of the vector U to the tip of the vector V, we'll draw a picture of this down below anyway, is the same as the vector V minus U. So V minus U is supposed to remind people of Q minus P. This is the vector from U to V. So it's saying that the length of the vector from U to V is less than or equal to the length of the vector of U plus the length of length of the vector v. So we'll draw, we'll, we'll draw that stuff down uh, again down the bottom. So let's write what we were saying here. So v minus u is equal to the vector from u to v. So let's draw. Let's say that's u. So that's V. And then the vector from U to V is the same as V minus U. And this is uh, basically the, the picture because the length of any one side of a triangle is always smaller than the sum of the other two. Because if you think about it, take it doesn't matter where you're going, I'll, I'll just draw a general triangle uh, over here. So for you to go from there to there, say we'll call this side one, side two, and I, I mean that by the, in terms of length. Um, so this going from here to here is the fastest possible thing. It's a straight line. So that means that the length of S1 is less than or equal to, like, so I mean, for example, if you're to drive up to Limerick, it's shorter than driving from, maybe not in time, drive to Waterford first, and then or maybe my picture is a bit off, isn't it? So let's say Tralee, uh, Limerick, Waterford, and I'll pretend in the roads are straight. So driving directly from Tralee to Waterford, all the roads are supposed to be the same here, is a shorter distance than driving from Tralee up to Limerick, and then driving from um, Limerick to Waterford. That's what we're saying. So this is the picture here. Um, now the pick that's the pick that's it's done. That's a hard question, but uh, it's to kind of finish off there that the length of v minus u, which is a length of one of the sides of the triangle, is less than or equal to the sum of the other two. Uh, the lengths of them. So that was a hard question. Uh, it's just kind of a pattern, uh, no single pattern. Okay, so that's a like that's a. Um, like you'll have a question on test, not a million models from that. Um, yeah, that kind of level. Okay, here's another question. Uh, if the vector W is P to Q, where P is a point and Q is a point, express the vector W in Cartesian form. Um, now the Cartesian is about, now I, I would have written earlier on something like, oh, Cartesian meant A, B, C. But actually, the essence of Cartesian is that it's along the x, along the y, along the z. And that's exactly what IJK are. And then find a vector of magnitude 11 in the direction opposite to that of w. OK. So um, the first bit should be OK. So w is the vector from p to q. And 
and we showed previously that the vector from P to Q is if they're point, it's the point Q minus the point P. So the point Q is minus one zero eight, and the point P is one three two. And just have to be careful with signs here. So minus one minus one is minus two. Zero minus three is minus three, and eight minus two is six. Okay. And in terms of i, j, k, we have minus two along the x, minus three along the y, and plus six along the z. So that's how you write it in terms of i, j, k. And I hope that's not too bad. Um, then find a vector of magnitude 11 in the direction opposite to that of w. So we'll draw a picture of this. And there's going to be a number of options. OK, so we have the vector uh, w, which uh, I'm going to draw something like this. Uh, here we kind of have some kind of an origin as such, uh, the origin. And we're looking for a vector of length 11, but in the opposite direction. That's what we're looking for. Now there's a number of options here. I can think of um, probably two options, okay? The first option is, um, we'll, we'll describe it in words um, rather than anything else. So the first option would be find W hat. Actually, I think there's, there's three ways of doing this. There's actually six ways of doing this, actually. So the, <laughs> there's three things you can do, right? There's three things you need to do. So the first is you find a unit vector. Okay, that's the, the basics. That's one thing you're gonna do at one stage. The other thing you're gonna do then is um, uh, find magnitude 11. So um, uh, get magnitude, 11. Okay, and then the last thing you have to do, and you can combine the, these two, is uh, change direction. And funnily enough, I think sort of six different orders there, and I'll, I'll just describe them geometrically if I can. So the first one uh, is probably what we're going to, um, it's not what we're going to do, but you find a unit vector, so you find w hat, then you can multiply that by 11, so you get this uh, vector longer than w, and then change the direction. Now, how you change the direction is you multiply by minus one. That's how you change direction. Okay, so that's the first option. The second one is you find the unit vector, that's w hat, then you change the direction, so you go to minus w hat, and that's actually what I'm going to recommend that we do. And then you multiply minus w hat by 11. That's the second option. But there's other options. First of all, uh, um, OK, they no, there actually isn't. There's, there's not six, there's four. The other possibility, sorry, there's exactly, I get three, is you change the direction first. So you find minus w. So you flip the direction of w. Then you turn that into a unit vector which would be the same as minus w hat, and then you multiply that by that. So there's a few different ways, but the way I'm recommending is we find w hat first. Um, so w hat is w divided by its own length. Now, just being a bit lazy, I'm gonna use the minus two, minus three, six. So I'll do minus two, minus three, six. I'll just double check that. Yeah. And then divide by the length of the same vector. Uh, and I have to do Pythagoras to that. So I get minus two, minus three, six, divided by, it probably would have made more sense to find the length of W first. I'm messing around a fair bit here. So I get minus two squared plus minus three squared 
plus six squared. And I think I get 40, the square root of 49 there. So I end up with minus two, minus three, six over seven. So that's my little double w hat. I'm going to change the direction of that by multiplying it by minus one. So minus this. So if you multiply this by minus one, all the components get multiplied by minus one. If I want, I could divide into seven here, but it doesn't actually make much of a difference. I just have to change all the signs. So I get, um, actually there's possibly confusion there. So I'm going to divide into seven just to show get the same thing. So I'm going to divide into seven here. So I get minus two sevenths, minus three sevenths, six sevenths. Because I want to say, I, I don't want you kind of ask, oh, why don't we multiply the seven by minus one as well? Which would be incorrect. So I can divide in the seven into these. So that's the thing inside the brackets. So this thing inside the brackets down the bottom here, that's w hat. And I want to get minus w hat, I multiply that by minus one. Um, and to multiply a vector by a scalar, you multiply everything in there by the scalar. So minus one by minus two sevenths is two sevenths. Minus three sevenths by minus one is three sevenths. And six sevenths by minus one is minus six sevenths. And the answer, what I'm looking for, is 11 times this. We don't have a name for this vector. Maybe we'll give it a, a name V. So we found W hat, it was one in the same direction as W. And we multiplied by minus one to get the opposite direction. And now if we multiply that little minus W hat, which is here, by 11, we get our answer. So V is 11 times this. And if you want, you can multiply it in, but there's no, no real need there. Okay, so it was just a bit of thinking involved uh, and really it's, you draw a picture. Okay. Um, right. So, yeah, so adding vectors, the length of vectors, multiplying by scalars, unit vectors. Now we're going to talk about multiplying vectors together, but this uh, things are going to get a bit confusing now. Okay. So, like numbers, you can add vectors. Like numbers, you can multiply them by numbers. Now, what I mean by that is, I can take a vector and multiply by a number. Um, can you multiply vectors together is the question. Now, you could write down your own making up multiplication. So for example, we've come up uh, over here on the left. Um, what about if I make, so this might be in that, like if you add vector, excuse me, if you multiply vectors, like you add them component wise. So say it's a vector in, um, the plane, say one along the x, two along the y, multiplied by, now I need a special symbol here. So I'm going to go with this rounding multiplication, say three, four, and if you multiply them component wise, so this is our own thing we just made up, one by three is three, two by four is eight. Now it turns out that that multiplication um, just doesn't have, it's not useful for anything. It doesn't have any prop. It doesn't have nice properties. It's useless, basically, absolutely stone cold useless. So uh, we'll just throw that out. So the obvious way of multiplying is junk. It doesn't do anything. So there's two ways of multiplying numbers. Excuse me, vectors that um, does make sense. So the first one is called the dot product. Um, so you take two vectors. Oh, we're going to call it, sorry. Um, so there's dot product, cross product, but they're also called scalar product, vector product. And we'll use, um, we'll try and use that terminology. So scalar product gives you a scalar, vector product gives you a vector, right? So the first one, oh, we'll have to go between the two of them because you, that's the notation, right? So um, this is the scalar product or the dot product. And the scalar product gives you a number. Now, that means that using this scalar, so a number or scalar. Now, I haven't told you how that works yet, but we will get there. And um, that means that you can't do the 
scalar product of three vectors because if you multiply the first two of them together you have a number but we're not defining a number dot product with a vector so we don't do for example um three dot product with a vector that just doesn't make sense because the dot product is supposed to take bet between two vectors okay so you can only multiply in this sense them two vectors together now the other one is a bit more you can do a bit more it's called the cross product or the vector product now this one does give you another vector and we call this the vector product and you and this is a really weird multiplication because you can in fact multiply together three vectors like this but it turns out that it's what's called non-associative which is really bad for multiplication so if you do uh, so we got say u cross v cross w and u cross v cross w now if you multiply together say five by six by seven it doesn't matter if you do five by six first or six by seven first, you get the same answer. And that's what's called associativity. But it turns out with the cross product, if you do the U cross V first, you get a different answer to whether you do the V cross W first. So what it means is that you, like, you can't really talk about the, when you talk about the cross product of three vectors, um, you have to specify is it the first two or the last two. And in fact, what it means is um, you only really do it with two vectors again. Anyway. So what I'm talking about here is there's, it's a way of multiplying together all of these things, just two vectors. In one of them, you get a number, and the other one, you get a vector. And they're very, very different things. So if you say, I multiply the vectors together, that's not precise. You have to say, I do the dot product, otherwise known as the scalar product, or I do the vector product, otherwise known as the cross product. So, um, so this is dot, this is cross, okay? The first, the, the dot product or the scalar product is used in applications to find the work done by a force, we'll see that. And the second is used to calculate the moment or the torque of a force. The reason being work, which is the same as energy, has no direction, it's just a scalar. Now, well, it, it can be negative, but it's, it's certainly a number. So work is a number, whereas, uh, a moment, a torque is actually a vector. It has a direction. There's a difference between righty tighty and lefty loosey. Okay. So we will uh, build up. Probably uh, we will see how do we do these. Let's see. We'll build them up slowly. Okay. So the first is the dot product. So this is you take two vectors. Say let's like, call it A and B. You multiply them together and you get a number and it can be positive or negative all right so we'll give you a rough sense of what the dot product scalar product does it measures in a rough sense how much the vectors pull together okay so vectors that uh, are kind of pulling together will have a large scalar product see the way these are kind of pulling together so they're going to have a large scalar product. Um, yeah. Vectors that are perpendicular, and, and a fancy word for that is orthogonal, are not pulling together at all. Are going to have a zero. Oh crap! Are going to have a zero dot product. So if two vectors are perpendicular. Their scalar product, their vector, uh, their scalar product, their dot product will be zero. In the first scenario, their scalar product will be positive. Because remember, it's a number, it'll be a number bigger than zero. And then when the vectors are working against each other, they're going to have a negative scalar product. So in this scenario, the dot product 
will be negative. Okay, now we're going to imagine some scenarios. Um, so the scenarios we're going to imagine, I think that for me, this is kind of the nice one. Um, I can get it right in my head. So imagine that A is displacement of supermarket trolleys. You know, when they move the trolleys, um, they move whatever, 10 of them, and they're moving between car parks and stuff. So A is going to be the displacement of one of these trolley trains. And B is going to be uh, the force of the uh, worker. Okay, so imagine A here is the trolleys and the person wants to move them along there from A, sorry, from here to here. And if they pull them like this, and um, now they should probably pull in exactly the same direction, but uh, we won't worry about that. Um, so what, what happens when somebody pulls trolleys? So A is the, basically the trolleys moving from here to here and B is pulling them. When they're pulling the trolleys in the same direction as the trolleys are going, they give the trolleys energy. They give it kinetic energy. That's the trolleys will speed up. So when you give something energy, you're doing positive work. So over here, you'll get positive work. Okay. The second scenario is a bit funny in this one. Um, so imagine the trolleys are going in one direction and the person is pushing the trolleys from the side. Now, if they're actually pushing them, okay, this, it, it doesn't work here. Okay, um, I haven't, okay, I haven't got a good, I haven't got a good uh, example for the second one. The third one is a bit more interesting and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to just do a proper picture here for you. So imagine we're gonna talk about the trolleys again and they're on a ramp. And there's loads of them. So these trolleys, have when they're all together they've got a, they're heavy enough like and um well that isn't the thing when they get moving they're hard to stop because uh, they get momentum so what you have to do when the trolleys are coming down the ramp is you have so they're going in this direction which is like a you have to apply a force you have to push against the trolleys you have to take energy away from the trolleys and when you do that, the kinetic energy is decreased and the trolleys slow down. And taking energy away is negative work. So that's what this is about, the negative dot product. Okay. Um, now, we haven't said how to even calculate a dot product, but we'll get there. Okay. And hopefully those stupid examples of the trolleys make more sense later. So um, we'll give a geometric definition of the dot product of two vectors. So we'll take two vectors. Uh, so here's V. And here's U. So we set a rough idea for what the dot product, the scalar product um, is, how much the vectors are pulling together. So what we have to do is we have to see how much of U is pulling in the same direction as V. And to find that out, we decompose it into something that's uh, parallel to V and perpendicular to V. So the perpendicular bit is this. So I'll call this U perpendicular. So it's perpendicular to V. So that bit, is not pushing at all in the same in direction as V. It's not pulling against it. It's not doing anything. That bit is not going to contribute. The bit of U that's going to contribute is the part of U that is parallel to V. Now, let, let it be said that um, the vector U, if you do a little triangle law, it's made up of a component parallel to V plus a component perpendicular to V. We can, we can always kind of do that. Um, sometimes those little bits will be zero. 
So what we do is, so the, the dot product really is going to be concerned with the parallel bit. And in fact, um, the dot product of U and V, the perpendicular bit doesn't matter. So this is actually going to be the same as the dot product of the parallel bit of U parallel to V and V. And the way it works is, now U parallel and V are pushing in the same direction. It just reduces to multiplication of their lengths now. So the length, it'll be the length of the parallel bit, in other words, the magnitude times the length of V. Okay, so that's pretty much what we've, we're gonna write down here. So U dot product V or scalar product V, is equal to the length of the part of U that's parallel to V times the length of V. It's, it's said slightly differently there. The scalar product is defined as the product of the length of V by the length of the projection of U onto V. This U parallel could also be called uh, the projection, uh, I'll just write projection because the rest of it's written there, uh, of the length of U onto V. Uh, there's probably something I should say as well. I will be saving the annotated PDF and sending it to you tomorrow. Okay. Now it turns out that we can get we we can do that's quite abstract. Well, um, like how do you how do you work with u parallel to v? So it turns out actually that you can find this u parallel to v because what you can do is you can write get a little triangle going and call this angle theta. Now that angle theta there is the angle between u and v. And we can find that in terms of the length of u. So I think what we're gonna do is something like do a little cosine in this little triangle. So the cosine of theta, and this is a right angle triangle, is the adjacent, which is the length of the parallel bit, divided by the length of U itself, which would be the high hypotenuse bit. So what that means, if you multiply both sides of this little equation by the length of U, you find that the length of the parallel bit, parallel to V, is the length of U times the, co the cos of the angle between the vectors. And so if I bang that into this formula here, I get the dot product or the scalar product of U and V is the length of the parallel bit, which is the length of U times the cos of theta times the length of V, where theta is the angle between U and V. And of course, length of U, length of V and cos of theta are all numbers, so I can write them in whatever order I want. And so what I end up is this nice little formula for the scalar product. Now, if the angle between the vectors is 90 degrees, cos of 90 is zero, you'll get that your uh, dot product is zero. If the angle is bigger than uh, 90 degrees, cos of such an angle is negative, you get the bit about if the vectors are pulling against each other, they have a negative dot product. Now, what's really interesting here is that if I write down two vectors in space, say for argument's sake, um, let's say u is equal to one, two, three, and v is equal to six, these are just made up numbers, six, zero, eight. Like if I asked you to go off and find the angle between those, you'd be here, you'd be like, what? It's difficult, like it is well defined, but it'd be very difficult to find it. But if you look at this little formula here, you've got the length of u, that's easy to find. The length of v, that's easy to find. And what you're gonna learn soon is that the dot product is actually really, really easy to calculate when they're in this Cartesian form. So this, what this really does for us is it allows you to find the angle between two vectors. Now, if you imagine two vectors in space, Imagine like throw your arms off in two different directions. There is a, a well-defined angle between them because two vectors, uh, if I just draw two vectors in space going off whatever angle, they do form their own 
plane and it's easy to find the angle between them then, or sorry to at least say what what it looks like okay and this little formula allows you to do this now usually what i do is use this formula and then solve for theta some people used to kind of um run like this now i think what i'm probably going to do is like it, it'd be a bit ridiculous for me to ask you to learn a form. Like if, if you're doing, sorry, it's not because the tests are supposed to be open book. So there's no learning of formulas. You have the manual in front of you doing the assessment. So I don't have to say, oh, learn it like this, learn it like this. I can do it in my notes using this thing. Uh, you can use the second thing if you want, it's up to you. Okay. Uh, but anyway, this is, uh, yeah, so this is good if we can learn how to find the dot products. Now, we just from that definition, we look at some um, properties. Um, so there's a big space here. I'm not sure what it's for. So I'll, do I have space for all my pictures? Yeah, I'll, I'll just draw little pictures for each of these. So the first picture um, here says, if the dot product of two vectors is zero, it implies that they're perpendicular or orthogonal. So the picture for one is the angle between the vectors is zero. Sorry, uh, 90. Vectors like that have a zero dot product. And on the other hand, if the dot product is zero, then, so it works both ways. If the dot product is zero, the angle is 90. And if the angle is 90, the dot product is zero. So they're equivalence, equivalencies. The second one says that if the two vectors are parallel, then the dot product is very easy. You just multiply the two lengths together. Um, now that is, so we're going to eventually write down this thing where we're eventually going to get to the point where we're going to say that work is the dot product of displacement and force. And you might be like, what are you talking about? It should just be distance by force, but not if the distance and force are in different directions. Um, but this second thing here is saying that if the displacement and the force are parallel, then it reduces to the work done by force is distance by force. So that's what you know about. The third example is when they're anti-parallel, which means they're just opposite directions. So the, ve uh, the dot product of these two, so this is number three, is, is uh, mi minus the product of the lengths. And the fourth one says that uh, it's just a kind of, a, I don't think it's really important for us. Um, the length of u is the square root of u dot u. Okay. let's have a little look at these. So in the first case, uh, we want to say if the dot product is zero, what can we say? So in this case, u dot v, we're saying this is going to be zero, is equal to the length of u times the length of v times the cost of the angle in between. And we're saying that this has to be zero. The exclamation mark there saying it has to be zero. Now, you've got three numbers here multiplied together. The length of u, the length of v, and the cost of theta. The length of u and length of v, we said that u and v aren't the zero vector, so they're not zero. So the only way that these numbers multiplied together give you zero is if cost of theta is zero. Now, if you want, I, I've got a unit circle here, but actually it's a bit easier. Let's just say we go to the calculator. So do inverse costs of both sides. They get theta is equal to inverse costs of zero, which is equal to 90 degrees, which is equal to pi over two radians. Okay. In other words, they're perp the two vectors are perpendicular if the dot product is zero. Um, yeah, that's that. Uh, the second one is saying, what is the second one saying? The second one says, if the dot product is the length of the first by the length of the second, then they have to be parallel. So if u dot v 
which is always equal to the length of u by the length of v by cos of theta. If that's equal to the length of u by the length of v, cos of theta has to be equal to one. Because it has to be length of u by length of v times one, only times one will give you length of u by length of v. Do inverse cos of both sides. Theta is equal to inverse cos of one, and the angle whose cos is one is zero degrees equals zero radians. Which, and if the angle between two vectors is zero, the angle between those is zero, they're parallel. Okay. Um, the next one is that it's a similar story. And this one um, follows from point two. So I think we said that if, um, if two vectors are parallel, so the first thing we'll say is a vector is parallel to itself. Agreed? Vectors in the same direction as itself. And that means that the dot product of u and itself should be just the product of the lengths, which is the length squared. And then just take the square root of both sides of this, and you get that the length of u is equal to the square root of u dot u. And I'll show you with an example, that's actually completely obvious. So if I look at, um, say the vector, say let's call it one minus three, seven. Um, if I do the square root of u, oh no, it's not obvious because I haven't told you how to do the dot product yet. Okay, okay, so we'll get there, right. So uh, where are we now? So in more, uh, yeah, okay. So the uh, this thing is what's called an if and only if statement. So I've said this a few times. If the dot product is zero, then it's parallel, uh, excuse me, perpendicular. But it works the other way around. If it's perpendicular, two vectors are perpendicular, then the dot product is zero. So it's kind of, you can give it as a, a summarized like this. So if the dot product is zero, then they're perpendicular. Um, and if, if one of them doesn't hold, the other one doesn't hold. So, um, is it the case that if the dot product is zero, is it possible that they're not perpendicular? No, it's not possible. This is just not possible. And if the dot product is not zero, it's not possible that they're perpendicular. So what this means is if you have this, you have this, and if you don't have this, you don't have this, you have this. So if the dot product is non-zero, they're not perpendicular. That's what an if and only if means. And we get some little um, corral, uh, little statements here about relation, uh, the dot products of these little unit vectors. So if I draw my little i, j, k, so remember i is one along the x, j is one along the y and k, k hat is one along the z. And just imagine this is the corner of a room. So we can write down some things. I is perpendicular to j. The angle between them is 90 degrees. And I think the other ones are easier to understand even from the picture. j is perpendicular to k and k is perpendicular to i. And then we have stuff like j is parallel to itself. So we know that if we have vectors that are perpendicular, they have a zero dot product. So I is perpendicular to J, so it has a zero dot product. The angle between them is 90. So the dot product of I and J is zero. Similarly, the dot product of I and K is zero. And similarly, the um, dot product of J and K is zero. And there's something that is very important that hasn't been said yet. Um, when you're multiplying in the sense of a dot product two vectors, the order does not matter. So A dot B would be the same as B dot A. That's not going to be the case when we do the cross product. Okay. 
So similar story. Um, I dot I is one, J dot J is one, and K dot K is one. So we just do one example with I here. So I dot I should be the length of I by the length of I times cos of the angle between them. Now remember, I is just a little, little vector here. What's the length of I? Well, length of I is one. To get one by one, the angle between I and itself is zero. I could just have I and another I, there's no angle between them. And cos of zero is one, so you get I dot I is one. Similarly, j dot j is one and k dot k is one. This is where I said these would be useful because with these um, little results here, we can find the how you find if you've got two vectors, how you actually calculate the dot product. Because you can't do it with the cost really because you don't know the angle in between. So what you have to do, now this looks a bit complicated down here, but I promise you it's actually very easy. What you have to do is you have to show the following thing, which isn't easy for us to show. We won't bother, just take my word for it. And it says that if, um, if you've got a vector u and you want to do the dot product of v plus w, that you can kind of multiply this out. Uh, just take my word for this. It's, it's actually, I, I can kind of explain it in a natural way. If you take my word that the dot products calculate work, this is just saying that the work done by a sum of forces, maybe the sum of forces, is equal to the sum of the work done by the first force plus the work done by the second force. That's all it's saying, really. Okay. And that means, it means we can multiply out things that if we have vectors say u and v with coordinates like this we can just multiply them all out this is what this distributivity says and it turns out that it's very easy then because if you multiply this out so say you do this one by this one now the i dot the i is one and so you're just left with ux times vx so you just multiply the um We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll actually just do an example first because it looks very confusing down there and I promise it's not. So if you had, so for example, vector one, two, three, that product with six, seven, minus two, all you do is, is you multiply the components like the wrong multiplication we saw earlier, but you don't form a vector, it's a number, you just add them together. So you do one multiplied by six, plus two multiplied by seven plus three multiplied by minus two. And it's a number. You don't leave, it's a number. So six plus 14 is 20 minus six is 14. So that's all you do. And um, now just to show that it is the, um, like just show where that comes from. Like, okay, so we had this thing about the length of u by the length of v times the cost of the angle in between. Then we said you can multiply them out. So what you do is just write down two general things and multiply this out. If you multiply it out, the i dot the i gives you one and you're just left with the ux times the vx. So if you do like that, this is one i dot six i. The one by the six gives you the six and the i dot i is one. So you're just left with one by six. Then the one i by the seven j, the i and the j, so I'll just write this down here. So if they do the one i by the seven j, but i and j are perpendicular, so their dot product is zero. Similarly, the one i by the minus two k gives you zero. Similarly, so I'll work down here. When I multiply the j's, so the v, the uyj, that product of the i gives me zero. The vyj by the k gives me zero. And I'm just left with vyj by vy, sorry, uyj. So again, I'll come up here. So this two is a 2j, and this is a 7j. And I get 2j dot with 7j. The two by the seven gives me 14. And the j dot j from above is just one. So I'm just left with 40 here. And that's all it is. So now I have made it possibly a bit more complicated than needed, but I just want to show where, where it did come from. Now there's a few things that you just please can't get wrong is 
So it, it looks like this, it's a number, not a vector. This was this made up um, multiplication we had earlier on that doesn't mean anything. Where you multiply the components together and you form a vector out of that. That is meaningless. Don't do this. This is the thing you're supposed to do. It's a number. And it does have meaning. So the important point now is, this is what we were saying before, u dot v, you can do it in the geometric picture and what you could call the algebraic picture. This is easy to calculate. This is easy to calculate. This is easy to calculate. And the only thing that's left over is the cost of theta, which is the difficult thing. So you can use the dot product to find the angle between two vectors, uh, which, is, which is useful. So say for the people, doing the gait analysis, maybe the angle between, so you go from hip to knee, hip to shoulder, maybe that angle should be a certain size. They would use this formula down here to calculate the ang that angle at all times and uh, to analyze the person's gait. And when the angle maybe is too big, that's a problem. Uh, whatever, the problem will go funny. Okay. So this means if we have two coordinate vectors, we can find the angle between them quite easily. So uh, we'll do just a little bit of algebra on that. So u dot v, which is easy to find, just multiply the x by the x plus the y by the y plus the z by the z, is equal to length of u, which is easy to find, times length of v, easy to find, square root sum of the squares, times the cost of the angle in between. So what you do here is you divide both sides by this to find that the cost of the angle between the two vectors is the dot product divided by the lengths multiplied together. And then to get rid of the costs, you do cos inverse of both sides. If you do cos inverse of both sides, you get that the angle between two vectors is cos inverse on your calculator, u dot v over magnitude of u times magnitude of v. So you can, if you want, you can kind of run with that formula if you want, I don't really mind. The big thing is that you understand that um, to find the angle between two vectors, use the that product, okay. Um, right, let's do a little example here. So w, is equal to i plus 4j plus t. Now, what the hell is t? So t here is variable. So I'll just kind of give you a, a try and explain what's going on here. So um, v is some fixed vector and w depends on t. So t is how far it goes in the um, z direction. So actually what we have with w is actually w depends on t. So if T is big and positive, W kind of points upwards. If T is zero, uh, W is kind of flat, you know, it, it, it's uh, parallel to the ground. If W is negative, it points down. So we get different values of T. So here you get like negative T, zero T, positive T, and you get all these ranges of values of W. So this might be maybe t equal to four, t equal to zero, say t equal to minus three for argument's sake. And we're trying to find, so imagine um, hold one arm out and start swinging your other arm. And so you're trying to, so different values of t are giving you different positions of the swinging arm. And you're trying to find the value of t such that they're perpendicular. So looking at this picture, it might be clear maybe T equal to four there looks perpendicular for argument's sake, and the others don't for argument's sake. Okay, so we, we need to find the value of T anyway. So the question is, recall that vectors are perpendicular when their scalar product is exactly zero. So if we wanna find, if we know that they're perpendicular, so um, if we're saying that W is to be perpendicular to V, and really W is loads of different vectors, different one for each value of T, then we know that their dot product is zero. And obviously that wasn't what I was supposed to write here. I was supposed to draw a picture. Okay.
Okay, so what we want is the dot product of W and V to be zero. Now I'm gonna write the, um, the W and the V in, in the brackets kind of jobby. So W dot V, there I won't, um, we'll, we'll see how we are for space. I'll do it, I'll do it separately afterwards. Okay, so we got I plus 4J plus TK, that's W, dotted with V, which is 2I plus 3J plus 7K. And the dot product, you multiply the X component by the X component, the Y component by the Y component, and the Z component by the Z component, and you end up with a number. So the component of I here is actually, it's not written there, but if I on its own means one I, so I get one by two, which is two, four by three, which is 12. And the component, the Z component of W is a variable, it's T. And it gets multiplied by seven here. And if these two things are to be perpendicular, this must equal zero. So you get a little equation in T, which hopefully isn't too hard to solve. So T by seven is the same as, um, well, we'll write the two plus 12 is 14. T by seven is seven T equal to zero. You've just got a little baby equation to solve here. Uh, I'm trying to get T on its own. The plus 14 is in the way. So to get rid of that plus 14, I do minus 14 to both sides. It gets rid of the 14 and left with 70 is equal to zero minus 14 is minus 14. Now the story is I'm trying to get T on its own, but it's multiplied by seven. I don't want it to be, I want it to be on its own. So the inverse of multiplying by seven is dividing by seven. And I do that to both sides. I get T is equal to minus two. And that's my answer. If T is equal to minus two, then the dot product of these two vectors is zero. And that means that they're perpendicular. So minus two is the value of t that makes these perpendicular. I was just going to say one thing where um, I said I could write this in a slightly different notation. I could, oh crap. I could have written this as w being one along the x, four along the y, t along the z, and the v as two, three, so that'd be a, a, just a different way of writing the same thing. And then I'd multiply the one by the two to get the two, the four by the three to get 12, and the t by the seven to get the 17. So that's um, the only alternative there. So there's another little applet here. If you want to put this into a browser and you can see, see this picture over here that didn't make any sense on the left, that you can actually see what's going on there with the different values of t and kind of play around with it until you see that the two vectors are perpendicular. So I don't have really much more to say. Yeah, this example is probably too big. We'll, we'll just outline it for the next day. So um, we've got a, a triangle defined by three points. So like in for the biomedical engineers, that might be knee, hip, shoulder. Um, so if A here, two along the X, one along the Y, zero along the Z. B is eight along the X, six along the Y, and zero along the Z and C is uh, a bit above it. So we want to find these vectors A to B, B to C and C to A, and we're going to use it. The vector from A to B is going to be B minus A and similar for the others. Check your answer by showing that these form a triangle. So all this thing here is saying that if you go from A to B and then go from B to C, and then go from C to A. Now there's plenty of length there, but you haven't actually gone anywhere. So if you don't go anywhere, the vector is zero. So that's what we're showing there. Find the lengths. Now, if you want to find the length of this, you're just going to find the length of the vector from B to C. That's going to be no problem. And then the last thing you're going to do is find the angle B, A, C, which is this angle there. And we'll leave talk of that and um, to the next day. So uh, just while I have you there, I'm just going to check what I said to you about the, oh, I can't check it there, uh, 
about the delivery mode. So you have the, the live, which is like tonight, which I think is very tough. And if you're going off watching these recorded, you can do that. We've hadn't had too many questions, you know. Um, so when did I say? Um, so you have a think. So the, it's in the it's in the announcements for the module on Canvas. It says week one and delivery model. It gives more thing. It gives an example of. Well, you have a fair. So the lectures, the pre-recorded lectures, would be like this, and um, probably a bit slicker, um, maybe not slicker. Pretty much similar, but like they'll be shorter overall. There'll be no break. Um, so you'll be able to, uh, they'll be shorter overall, basically. Um, yeah, so it's before 12 o'clock on Thursday, uh, you have a vote and you give him what order you want it. Uh, you pick your favorite, your second favorite and your third favorite and uh, we'll run the vote like that. Um, so that I'll be sending you an email tomorrow. It'll be in that email. Uh, any more questions? tonight before we wrap it up. So the other thing in the email tomorrow is I'll be um, the exercises that I recommend that you 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 do, but um, there'll probably be a bit of a delay on that because, well, you still should do them, but you won't necessarily be submitting them unless we go for the offline option. Um, but you should you should still be hoping to find time to do exercises. I think that's everything we have. Yeah, in terms of tests, we're looking at weeks five, eight, um, 11 and 13. Um, you'll be getting an email tomorrow with more information. Yeah, I think that's it. We'll leave it go there. Um, and we'll talk to you again. Uh, bye. Thanks. What are